Section 16 of Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Rato Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood Sand Chapter 9 An hour before sunset, Henriot put his rugs and food upon a donkey, and gave the boy directions where to meet him, a considerable distance from the appointed spot. He went himself on foot. He slipped in the heat along the sandy street, where strings of camels still go slouching, shuffling with their loads from the quarries that built the pyramids, and he felt that little friendly Helouan tried to keep him back, but desire now was far too strong for caution. The desert tide was rising. It easily swept him down the long white street towards the enormous deeps beyond. He felt the pull of a thousand miles before him, and twice a thousand years drove at his back. Everything still basked in the sunshine. He passed al Hayat the stately hotel that dominates the village like a palace built against the sky, and in its pillared colonnades and terraces he saw the throngs of people having late afternoon tea and listening to the music of a regimental band. Men in flannels were playing tennis, parties were climbing off donkeys after long excursions. There was laughter, talking, a babble of many voices. The gaiety called to him. The everyday spirit whispered to stay and join the crowd of lively human beings. Soon there would be merry dinner parties, dancing, voices of pretty women, sweet white dresses, singing, and the rest. Soft eyes would question and turn dark. He picked out several girls he knew among the palms, but it was all many, oh, so many leagues away. Centuries lay between him and this modern world. An indescribable loneliness was in his heart. He went searching through the sands of forgotten ages and wandering among the ruins of a vanished time. He hurried. Already the deeper water caught his breath. He climbed the steep rise toward the plateau where the observatory stands and saw two of the officials whom he knew taking a siesta after their long day's work. He felt that his mind, too, had dived and searched among the heavenly bodies that live in silent, changeless peace, remote from the world of men. They recognized him, these two, whose eyes also knew a tremendous distance close. They beckoned, waving the straws through which they sipped their drinks from tall glasses. Their voices floated down to him as from the star fields. He saw the sun gleam upon the glasses and heard the clink of the ice against the sides. The stillness was amazing. He waved an answer and passed quickly on. He could not stop the sliding current of the years. The tide moved faster, the draw of piled-up cycles urging it. He emerged upon the plateau and met the cooler desert air. His feet went crunching on the desert film that spread its curious, dark, shiny carpet as far as the eye could reach. It lay everywhere, unswept and smooth as when the feet of vanished civilizations trod its burning surface, then dipped behind the curtains time pins against the stars. And here the body of the tide set all one way. There was a greater strength of current, draft and suction. He felt the powerful undertow. Deeper masses drew his feet sideways, and he felt the rushing of the central body of the sand. The sands were moving from their foundation upwards. He went unresistingly with them. Turning a moment, he looked back at shining little Helouan in the blaze of evening light. The voices reached him very faintly, merged now in a general murmur. Beyond lay the strip of delta, vivid green, the palms, the roof of Bedrashein, the blue laughter of the Nile with its flocks of curved felucca sails. 
Further still, rising above the yellow Libyan horizon, gloomed the vast triangles of a dozen pyramids, cutting their wedge-shaped clefts out of a sky, fast crimsoning through a sea of gold. Seen thus, their dignity imposed upon the entire landscape. They towered darkly, symbolic signatures of the ancient powers that now watched him taking these little steps across their damaged territory. He gazed a minute, then went on. He saw the big pale face of the moon in the east. Above the ever-silent thing, these giant symbols once interpreted, she rose, grand, effortless, half terrible as themselves. And with her she lifted up this tide of the desert that drew his feet across the sand to Wadi Hof. A moment later he dipped below the ridge that buried Helouan and Nile and pyramids from sight. He entered the ancient waters. Time then, in an instant, flowed back behind his footsteps, obliterating every trace. And with it his mind went too. He stepped across the gulf of centuries, moving into the past. The desert lay before him an open tomb wherein his soul should read presently of things long vanished. The strange half-lights of sunset began to play their witchery then upon the landscape. A purple glow came down upon the Mogatam hills. Perspective danced its tricks of false, incredible deception. The soaring kites that were a mile away seemed suddenly close, passing in a moment from the size of gnats to birds with a fabulous stretch of wing. Ridges and cliffs rushed close without a hint of warning, and level places sank into declivities and basins that made him trip and stumble. That indescribable quality of the desert, which makes timid souls avoid the hour of dusk, emerged. It spread everywhere, undisguised and the bewilderment it brings is no vain imagined thing, for it distorts vision utterly, and the effect upon the mind when familiar sight goes floundering is the simplest way in the world of dragging the anchor that grips reality. At the hour of sunset this bewilderment comes upon a man with a disconcerting swiftness. It rose now with all this weird rapidity, Henriot found himself enveloped at a moment's notice. But, knowing well its effect, he tried to judge it and pass on. The other matters, the object of his journey chief of all, he refused to dwell upon with any imagination. Wisely, his mind, while never losing sight of it, declined to admit the exaggeration that over-elaborate thinking brings. I am going to witness an incredible experiment in which two enthusiastic religious dreamers believe firmly, he repeated to himself. I have agreed to draw anything I see. There may be truth in it, or they may be merely self-suggested vision due to an artificial exaltation of their minds. I am interested, perhaps against my better judgment, yet I'll see the adventure out, because I must. This was the attitude he told himself to take. Whether it was the real one, or merely adopted to warm a cooling courage, he could not tell. The emotions were so complex and warring. His mind automatically kept repeating this comforting formula. Deeper than that he could not see to judge, for a man who knew the full content of his thought at such a time would solve some of the oldest psychological problems in the world. Sand had already buried judgment, and with it all attempt to explain the adventure by the standards acceptable to his brain of today, he steered subconsciously through a world of dim, huge, half-remembered wonders. The sun, with that abrupt Egyptian suddenness, was below the horizon now. The pyramid field had swallowed it. Ra, in his golden boat, sailed distant seas beyond the Libyan wilderness. Henriot walked on and on, aware of utter loneliness. He was walking fields of dream, too remote from modern life to recall companionship he once had surely known. How dim it was! How deep and distant! 
how lost in this sea of an incalculable past. He walked into the places that are soundless. The soundlessness of ocean miles below the surface was about him. He was with one only, this unfathomable, silent thing where nothing breathes or stirs, nothing but sunshine, shadow, and the wind-born sand. Slowly in front the moon climbed up the eastern sky, hanging above the silence, silence that ran unbroken across the horizons to where Suez gleamed upon the waters of a sister sea in motion. That moon was glinting now upon the Arabian mountains by its desolate shores. Southward stretched the wastes of Upper Egypt a thousand miles to meet the Nubian wilderness. But over all these separate deserts stirred the soft whisper of the moving sand, deep murmuring message that life was on the way to unwind death. The Ka of Egypt, swathed in centuries of sand, hovered beneath the moon towards her ancient tenement. For the transformation of the desert now began in earnest. It grew apace. Before he had gone the first two miles of his hour's journey, the twilight caught the rocky hills and twisted them into those monstrous revelations of physiognomies they barely take the trouble to conceal even in the daytime. And while he well understood the eroding agencies that have produced them, there yet rose in his mind a deeper interpretation lurking just behind their literal meanings. Here, through the motionless surfaces, that nameless thing the desert ill conceals urged outwards into embryonic form and shape, akin, he almost felt, to those immense deific symbols of other life the Egyptians knew and worshipped. Hence from the desert had first come, he felt, the unearthly life they typified in their monstrous figures of granite, evoked in their stately temples and communed with in the ritual of their mystery ceremonials. This watching aspect of the Libyan desert is really natural enough, but it is just the natural, Henriot knew, that brings the deepest revelations. The surface limestones resisting the erosion block themselves ominously against the sky, while the softer sand beneath sets them on altered pedestals that define their isolation splendidly. Blunt and unconquerable, these masses now watched him pass between them. The desert surface formed them, gave them birth. They rose, they saw, they sank down again. Waves upon a sea that carried forgotten life up from the depths below. Of forbidding, even menacing type, they somewhere mated with genuine grandeur. Unformed according to any standard of human or of animal faces, they achieved an air of giant physiognomy which made them terrible. The unwinking stare of eyes, lidless eyes that yet ever succeed in hiding, looked out under well-marked, level eyebrows, suggesting a vision that included the motives and purposes of his very heart. They looked up grandly, understood why he was there, and then slowly withdrew their mysterious, penetrating gaze. The strata built them so marvelously up, the heavy, threatening brows, thick lips curved by the ages into a semblance of cold smiles, jowls drooping into sandy heaps that climbed against the cheeks, protruding jaws and the suggestion of shoulders just about to lift the entire bodies out of the sandy beds, this host of countenances conveyed a solemnity of expression that seemed everlasting, implacable as death. Of human signature they bore no trace, nor was comparison possible between their kind and any animal life. They peopled the desert here, and their smiles, concealed yet just discernible, went broadening with the darkness into a desert laughter. The silence bore it underground, but Henriot was aware of it. The troop of faces slipped into that single enormous countenance which is the visage of the sand, and he saw it everywhere yet nowhere. Thus with the darkness grew his imaginative interpretation of the desert, yet there was construction in it, 
a construction, moreover, that was not entirely his own. Powers, he felt, were rising, stirring, wakening from sleep. Behind the natural faces that he saw, these other things peered gravely at him as he passed. They used, as it were, materials that lay ready to their hand. Imagination furnished these hints of outline, yet the powers themselves were real. There was this amazing movement of the sand. By no other manner could his mind have conceived of such a thing, nor dreamed of this simple yet dreadful method of approach. Approach! That was the word that first stood out and startled him. There was approach. Something was drawing nearer. The desert rose and walked beside him. For not alone these ribs of gleaming limestone contributed towards the elemental visages, but the entire hills, of which they were an outcrop, ran to assist in the formation and were a necessary part of them. He was watched and stared at from behind, in front, on either side, and even from below. The sand that swept him on kept even pace with him. It turned luminous, too, with a patchwork of glimmering effect that was indescribably weird. Lanterns glowed within its substance, and by their light he stumbled on, glad of the Arab boy he would presently meet at the appointed place. The last torch of the sunset had flickered out, melting into the wilderness, when suddenly opening at his feet gaped the deep, wide gully known as Wadi Hoth. Its curve swept past him. This first impression came upon him with a certain violence, that the desolate valley rushed, he saw but a section of its curve and sweep, but through its entire length of several miles the wadi fled away. The moon whitened it like snow, piling black shadows very close against the cliffs. In the flood of moonlight it went rushing past. It was emptying itself. For a moment the stream of movement seemed to pause and look up into his face, then instantly went on again upon its swift career. It was like the procession of a river to the sea. The valley emptied itself to make way for what was coming. The approach, moreover, had already begun. Conscious that he was trembling, he stood and gazed into the depths, seeking to steady his mind by the repetition of the little formula he had used before. He said it half aloud. But while he did so, his heart whispered quite other things. Thoughts the woman and the man had sown rose up in a flock and fell upon him like a storm of sand. Their impetus drove off all support of ordinary ideas. They shook him where he stood, staring down into this river of strange invisible movement that was hundreds of feet in depth and a quarter of a mile across. He sought to realize himself as he actually was today, mere visitor to Helouan, tempted into this wild adventure with two strangers. But in vain. That seemed a dream, unreal, a transient detail picked out from the enormous past that now engulfed him, heart and mind and soul. This was the reality. The shapes and faces that the hills of sand built round him were the play of excited fancy only. By sheer force he pinned his thought against this fact, but further he could not get. There were powers at work. They were being stirred, wakened somewhere into activity. Evocation had already begun. That sense of their approach as he had walked along from Helouan was not imaginary a descent of some type of life, vanished from the world too long for recollection, was on the way, so vast that it would manifest itself in a group of forms, a troop, a host, an army. These two were near him somewhere at this very moment, already long at work, their minds driving beyond this little world. The valley was emptying itself for the descent of life their ritual invited. And the movement in the sand was likewise true. 
He recalled the sentences the woman had used. My body, he reflected, like the bodies life makes use of everywhere, is mere upright heap of earth and dust and sand. Here in the desert is the raw material, the greatest store of it in the world. And on the heels of it came sharply that other thing, that this descending life would press into its service all loose matter within its reach, to form that sphere of action which would be in a literal sense its body. In the first few seconds as he stood there he realized all this, and realized it with an overwhelming conviction it was futile to deny. The fast emptying valley would lay her brim with an unaccustomed and terrific life. Yet death hid there too, a little ugly insignificant death. With the name of Vance it flashed upon his mind and vanished, too tiny to be thought about in this torrent of grander messages that shook the depths within his soul. He bowed his head a moment, hardly knowing what he did. He could have waited thus a thousand years, it seemed. He was conscious of a wild desire to run away, to hide, to efface himself utterly, his terror, his curiosity, his little wonder, and not be seen of anything. But it was all vain and foolish. The desert saw him. The gigantic knew that he was there. No escape was possible any longer. Caught by the sand he stood amid eternal things. The river of movement swept him, too. These hills, now motionless as statues, would presently glide forward into the cavalcade, sway like vessels, and go past with the procession. At present only the contents, not the frame of the wadi, moved. An immense soft brush of moonlight swept it empty for what was on the way. But presently the entire desert would stand up and also go. Then, making a sideways movement, his feet kicked against something soft and yielding that lay heaped upon the desert floor, and Henriot discovered the rugs the Arab boy had carefully set down before he made full speed for the friendly lights of Helwan. The sound of his departing footsteps had long since died away. He was alone. The detail restored to him his consciousness of the immediate present and, stooping, he gathered up the rugs and overcoat and began to make preparations for the night. But the appointed spot, whence he was to watch, lay upon the summit of the opposite cliffs. He must cross the wadi bed and climb. Slowly and with labor he made his way down a steep cleft into the depth of the wadi hof, sliding and stumbling often, till at length he stood upon the floor of shining moonlight. It was very smooth, windless, utterly, still as space, each particle of sand lay in its ancient place asleep. The movement, it seemed, had ceased. He clambered next up the eastern side, through pitch-black shadows, and within the hour reached the ledge upon the top whence he could see below him, like a silvered map, the sweep of the valley bed. The wind nipped keenly here again, coming over the leagues of cooling sand. Loose boulders of splintered rock, started by his climbing, crashed and boomed into the depths. He banked the rugs beneath him, wrapped himself in his overcoat, and lay down to wait. Behind him was a two-foot crumbling wall against which he leaned, in front a drop of several hundred feet through space. He lay upon a platform, therefore, invisible from the desert at his back. Below the curving wadi formed a natural amphitheater, in which each separate boulder fallen from the cliffs, and even the little scylla shrubs the camels eat, were plainly visible. He noted all the bigger ones among them. He counted them over half aloud and the moving stream he'd been unaware of when crossing the bed itself now began again. The wadi went rushing past before the broom of moonlight. Again the enormous and the tiny combined in one single strange impression, for through his conception of great movement stirred also a roving, delicate touch that his imagination felt as bird-like. 
Behind the solid mass of the desert's immobility flashed something swift and light and airy. Bizarre pictures interpreted it to him, like rapid snapshots of a huge flying panorama. He thought of darting dragonflies seen at Helouan, of children's little dancing feet, of twinkling butterflies, of birds. Chiefly, yes, of a flock of birds in flight, whose separate units formed a single entity. The idea of the group soul possessed his mind once more, but it came with a sense of more than curiosity or wonder. Veneration lay behind it, a veneration touched with awe. It rose in his deepest thought that here was the first hint of a symbolical representation, a symbol, sacred and inviolable, belonging to some ancient worship that he half remembered in his soul stirred towards interpretation through all his being. He lay there waiting, wondering vaguely where his two companions were, yet fear all vanished because he felt attuned to a scale of things too big to mate with definite dread. There was a high anticipation in him, but not anxiety. Of himself, as Felix Henriot, indeed, he hardly seemed aware. He was someone else or rather he was himself at a stage he'd known once far, far away, in a remote pre-existence. He watched himself from dim summits of a past, of which no further details were as yet recoverable. Pencil and sketching block lay ready to his hand. The moon rose higher, tucking the shadows ever more closely against the precipices, the silver passed into a sheet of snowy whiteness that made every boulder clearly visible. Solemnity deepened everywhere into awe. The wadi fled silently down the stream of hours. It was almost empty now, and then abruptly he was aware of change. The motion altered somewhere. It moved more quietly. Pace slackened. The end of the procession that evacuated the depth and length of it went trailing past and turned the distant bend. It's slowing up, he whispered, as sure of it as though he'd watched a regiment of soldiers filing by. The wind took off his voice like a flying feather of sound. And there was a change. It had begun. Night and the moon stood still to watch and listen. The wind dropped utterly away. The sand ceased its shifting movement. The desert everywhere stopped still and turned. Some curtain, then, that for centuries had veiled the world, drew softly up, leaving a shaded vista down which the eyes of his soul peered towards long-forgotten pictures. Still buried by the sands too deep for full recovery, he had perceived dim portions of them, things once honored and loved passionately. For once they had surely been to him the whole of life, not merely a fragment for cheap wonder to inspect, and they were curiously familiar, even as the person of this woman who now evoked them was familiar. Henriot made no pretense to more definite remembrance, but the haunting certainty rushed over him deeper than doubt or denial and with such force that he felt no effort to destroy it. Some lost sweetness of spiritual ambitions, lived for with this passionate devotion, and passionately worshipped as men today worship fame and money, revived in him with a tempest of high glory. Centers of memories turned from an age-long sleep, so that he could have wept at their so complete obliteration hitherto that such majesty had departed from the world as though it had never existed was a thought for desolation and for tears and though the little fragment he was about to witness might be crude in itself and incomplete yet it was part of a vast system that once explored the richest realms of deity the reverence in him contained a holiness of the night and of the stars great gentle awe lay in it too for he stood, aflame with anticipation and humility, at the gateway of sacred things. And this was the mood, no thrill of cheap excitement or alarm to weaken it, in which he first became aware that two spots of darkness he had taken all along for boulders on the snowy valley bed 
were actually something very different. They were living figures. They moved. It was not the shadow slowly following the moonlight, but the stir of human beings who all these hours had been motionless as stone. He must have passed them unnoticed within a dozen yards when he crossed the wadi bed, and a hundred times from this very ledge his eyes had surely rested on them without recognition. Their minds, he knew full well, had not been inactive as their bodies. The important part of the ancient ritual lay, he remembered, in the powers of the evoking mind. Here, indeed, was no effective nor theatrical approach of the principal figures. It had nothing in common with the cheap external ceremonial of modern days. In forgotten powers of the soul its grandeur lay, potent, splendid, true. Long before he came, perhaps all through the day, these two had labored with their arduous preparations. They were there, part of the desert, when hours ago he had crossed the plateau in the twilight. To them, to this woman's potent working of old ceremonial, had been due that singular rush of imagination he had felt. He had interpreted the desert as alive. Here was the explanation. It was alive. Life was on the way. Long latent, her intense desire summoned it back to physical expression, and the effect upon him had steadily increased as he drew nearer to the center where she would focus its revival and return. Those singular impressions of being watched and accompanied were explained. A priest of this old world worship performed a genuine evocation. A great one of vision revived the cosmic powers. Henriot watched the small figures far below him with a sense of dramatic splendor that only this association of far-off memory could account for. It was their rising now and the lifting of their arms to form a slow revolving outline that marked the abrupt cessation of the larger river of movement. For the sweeping of the wadi sank into sudden stillness and these two, with motions not unlike some dance of deliberate solemnity, pass slowly through the moonlight to and fro. His attention fixed upon them both. All other movement ceased. They fastened the flow of time against the desert's body. What happened then? How could his mind interpret an experience so long denied that the power of expression, as of comprehension, has ceased to exist? How to translate this symbolical representation, small detail though it was, of a transcendent worship entombed for most so utterly beyond recovery. Its splendor could never lodge in minds that conceived deity perched upon a cloud within telephoning distance of fashionable churches. How should he phrase it even to himself, whose memory drew up pictures from so dim a past that the language fit to frame them lay unreachable and lost? Henriot did not know. Perhaps he never yet has known. Certainly at the time he did not even try to think. His sensations remain his own, untranslatable, and even that instinctive description the mind gropes for automatically floundered, halted, and stopped dead. Yet there rose within him somewhere, from depths long drowned in slumber, a reviving power by which he saw, divined, and recollected, remembered seemed too literal a word, these elements of a worship he once had personally known. He, too, had worshipped thus. His soul had moved amid similar evocations in some aeonian past, whence now the sand was being cleared away. Symbols of stupendous meaning flashed and went their way across the lifting mists. He hardly caught their meaning. So long it was since he had known them, yet they were familiar as the faces seen in dreams, and some hint of their spiritual significance left faint traces in his heart by means of which their grandeur reached towards interpretation. And all were symbols of a cosmic, deific nature, of powers that only symbols can express, prayer books and sacraments used in the wisdom religion of an older time, but today known only in the decrepit literal shell which is their degradation. Grandly the figures moved across the valley bed. 
the powers of the heavenly bodies once more joined them. They moved to the measure of a cosmic dance whose rhythm was creative. The universe partnered them. There was this transfiguration of all common external things. He realized that appearances were visible letters of a soundless language, a language he once had known. The powers of night and moon and desert sand married with points in the fluid stream of his innermost spiritual being that knew and welcomed them. He understood. Old Egypt herself stooped down from her uncovered throne. The stars sent messengers. There was commotion in the secret sandy places of the desert, for the desert had grown temple. Columns reared against the sky. There rose from leagues away the chanting of the sand. The temples where once this came to pass were gone, their ruin questioned by alien hearts that knew not their spiritual meaning. But here the entire desert swept in to form a shrine, and the majesty that once was Egypt stepped grandly back across ages of denial and neglect. The sand was altar, and the stars were altar lights. The moon lit up the vast recesses of the ceiling, and the wind from a thousand miles brought in the perfume of her incense. For with that faith which shifts mountains from their sandy bed, two passionate believing souls invoked the Ka of Egypt. And the motions that they made, he saw, were definite harmonious patterns their dark figures traced upon the shining valley floor, like the points of compasses with stems invisible and directed from the sky, their movements marked the outlines of great signatures of power, the sigils of the type of life they would evoke. It would come as a procession. No individual outline could contain it. It needed for its visible expression many. The descent of a group soul, known to the worship of this mighty system, rose from its lair of centuries and moved hugely down upon them. The Ka, answering to the summons, would mate with sand. The desert was its body. Yet it was not this that he'd come to fix with block and pencil. Not yet was the moment when his skill might be of use. He waited, watched, and listened, while this river of half-remembered things went past him. The patterns grew beneath his eyes like music. Too intricate and prolonged to remember with accuracy later, he understood that they were forms of that root geometry which lies behind all manifested life. The mold was being traced in outline. Life would presently inform it, and a singing rose from the maze of lies whose beauty was like the beauty of the constellations. The sound was very faint at first, but grew steadily in volume. Although no echoes, properly speaking, were possible, these precipices caught stray notes that trooped in from the further sandy reaches. The figures certainly were chanting, but their chanting was not all he heard. Other sounds came to his ears from far away, running past him through the air from every side and from incredible distances, all flocking down into the wadi bed to join the parent note that summoned them. The desert was giving voice, and memory, lifting her hood yet higher, showed more of her gray, mysterious face that searched his soul with questions. Had he so soon forgotten that strange union of form and sound which once was known to the evocative rituals of olden days? Henriot tried patiently to disentangle this desert music that their intoning voices woke from the humming of the blood in his own veins, but he succeeded only in part. Sand was already in the air. There was reverberation, rhythm, measure. There was almost the breaking of the stream into great syllables. But was it due, this strange reverberation, to the countless particles of sand meeting in mid-air about him, or to larger bodies whose surfaces caught this friction of the sand and threw it back against his ears? The wind, now rising, brought particles that stung his face and hands and filled his eyes with the minute fine dust that partially veiled the moonlight. 
But was not something larger, vaster, these particles composed, now also on the way? Movement and sound and flying sand thus merged themselves more and more in a single whirling torrent, but Henriot sought no commonplace explanation of what he witnessed, and here was the proof that all happened in some vestibule of inner experience where the strain of question and answer had no business. One sitting beside him need not have seen anything at all. His host, for instance, from Helouan, need not have been aware. Night screened it. Helouan, as the whole of modern experience, stood in front of the screen. This thing took place behind it. He crouched motionless, watching in some reconstructed antechamber of the soul's pre-existence, while the torrent grew into a veritable tempest. Yet night remained unshaken. The veil of moonlight did not quiver. The stars dropped their slender golden pillars unobstructed. Calmness reigned everywhere as before. The stupendous representation passed on behind it all. But the dignity of the little human movements that he watched had become now indescribable. The gestures of the arms and bodies invested themselves with consummate grandeur as these two strode into the caverns behind manifested life and drew forth symbols that represented vanished powers. The sound of their chanting voices broke in cadenced fragments against the shores of language. The words Henriot never actually caught, if words they were, yet he understood their purport, these names of power to which the type of returning life gave answer as they approached. He remembered fumbling for his drawing materials with such violence, however, that the pencil snapped in two between his fingers as he touched it. For now, even here upon the outer fringe of the ceremonial ground, there was a stir of forces that set the very muscles working in him before he had become aware of it. Then came the moment when his heart leaped against his ribs with a sudden violence that was almost pain, standing a second later still as death. The lines upon the valley floor ceased their maze-like dance. All movements stopped sound died away. In the midst of this profound and dreadful silence the sigils lay empty there below him. They waited to be informed, for the moment of entrance had come at last. Life was close. And he understood why this return of life had all along suggested a procession, and could be no mere momentary flash of vision from such appalling distance did it sweep down towards the present. Upon this network, then, of splendid lines at length held rigid, the entire desert reared itself with walls of curtained sand that dwarfed the cliffs, the shouldering hills, the very sky. The desert stood on end, as once before he had dreamed it from his balcony windows, it rose upright, towering and close against his face. It built sudden ramparts to the stars that chambered the thing he witnessed behind walls no centuries could ever bring down crumbling into dust. He himself, in some curious fashion, lay just outside, viewing it apart. As from a pinnacle he peered within, peered down with straining eyes into the vast picture gallery memory threw abruptly open and the picture spaced its noble outline thus against the very stars. He gazed between columns that supported the sky itself like pillars of sand that swept across the field of vanished years. Sand poured and streamed aside, laying bare the past. For down the enormous vista into which he gazed as into an avenue running a million miles toward the tiny point, he saw this moving thing that came towards him, shaking loose the countless veils of sand the ages had swathed about it. The Ka of buried Egypt wakened out of sleep. She had heard the potent summons of her old time-honored ritual. She came. She stretched forth an arm towards the worshippers who evoked her. Out of the desert, 
out of the leagues of sand, out of the immeasurable wilderness which was her mummied form and body, she rose and came, and this fragment of her he would actually see, this little portion that was obedient to the stammered and broken ceremonial, the partial revelation he would witness, yet so vast even this little bit of it, that it came as a procession and a host. For a moment there was nothing, and then the voice of the woman rose in a resounding cry that filled the wadi to its furthest precipices before it died away again to silence. That a human voice could produce such volume, accent, depth, seemed half incredible. The walls of towering sand swallowed it instantly, but the procession of life, needing a group, a host, an army for its physical expression, reached at that moment the nearer end of the huge avenue. It touched the present. It entered the world of men. End of chapter 9 of Sand